Hello, livestock friends, and welcome to this edition of Before the Bid. This is a podcast dedicated to the livestock sales industry where we go behind the scenes of the operation and speak straight to the sellers. We discuss topics about the important aspects of their operation, location, the people behind the prep work, and talk about some of the animals that will be offered to you, the prospective buyers. Hopefully, you've got your sale catalog close by. You might have to go look through that pile on your desk. But if not, then you're probably like me and driving down the road or busy with chores around the farm. And that's okay, too. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I hope you enjoy this segment of Before the Bid. I'm your host, Andy Howell. Welcome, Livestock Friends, to this edition of Before the Bid Podcast. And uh, I have contacted guy tonight that we're going to talk to that we're going on the pig side for this podcast. And we are talking to a guy that has been in the, the hog industry for 50, 50 years. And he is from Northwood, Iowa. And uh, he has uh, a couple children that uh, he's going to talk about, or young adults, I guess. I should say, and he's got five of them, and uh, something that I found very interesting is that four of them are teachers, so uh, I enjoy that, uh, enjoy hearing about that as, as I am a teacher myself, and, and also, he just finished up his crops, he's got all of his equipment in the barn, so I'm sure uh, maybe some of you are going to be jealous uh, about that, but uh, a guy that really gets after it, and, and a guy that I have had so much fun getting ready for this podcast, and tonight, again, we're going to Northwood, Iowa, and we're going Going to talk to Ray Gaskill, and uh, he's going to have a pig sale here on uh, showpigs.com. And so uh, excited to talk to him tonight, and, and we're going to talk about some things like frozen boar semen, uh, something that uh, that I was very interested in hearing about, and, and we're going to talk about it uh, when we go down through there. And so uh, again, want to welcome my guest Ray Gaskill. And Ray, uh, usually I start out with with questions for for people, but uh, I think I think you might have a question for us. Yeah, when <clears throat> I was contacted by Brandy, I was uh, about doing this podcast. I was surprised from the standpoint that I'm not on social media. So how it was that you came up with my name or the prospect of it even um, doing this podcast with me. Right. Well, Ray, uh, I'll tell you, you're, you're out there more than, more than maybe, you know, uh, if you do a little bit of searching and uh, Brandy did some, some more searching and that's how we found some of those pigs that uh, you have been successful with here this last couple of years. And uh, so she does a very nice job of of doing research and, and going through a, a few lists on a few different things and, uh, so uh, I'm glad I have her, and, and uh, it worked out, and, and I'm so glad that uh, we got in contact with you. And uh, I, I think we're, uh, we're going to have a great conversation here, and, and I hope everybody uh, enjoys it as, as much as I'm sure I will. She, she does a, a great job of, of, uh, of doing some research and, and finding people. So we appreciate uh, you being willing to, to come on here and do this, and uh, I sure am excited about it. Okay, hey, looking forward to it. Ray, as I always do, uh, I, I like to start these podcasts off with, with some history of the operation. And and uh, as I mentioned in the opening, you have been in the, the hog business right at 50 years. And uh, so so I'm sure there, there's quite a bit of history for you to talk about uh, here to, to introduce people that, as you say, you're not on social media. So maybe this might be a, a good way to uh, tell other people about your operation. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, we're close to 50 years. This all started my junior year of high school back in 1972. Uh, I, in the egg shop class, uh, built a six-man hog house Mm -hmm. that I was going to use to, you know, farrow some pigs in. So when that was completed that summer, I proceeded to go up to Bob Bryson at Alden, Minnesota to pick out a few hemp gilts to start my FFA project with. So like a lot of them, I'm, I'm going to guess this thing is a little FFA project gone rogue, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> probably. Now I'm a big, because you know that uh, most 4-Hers and FFAers never really graduate. They just get older. Right. They, they live their dreams through their kids for the success that they weren't able to achieve. <laughs> right, right. Know a lot of those. So then back in uh, 
early 80s, I decided to start raising purebred Durox mm -hmm. and selling breeding stock. And so I proceeded to go down to Bill Ranges in Marissa, Illinois, and went to Warren Carpenters uh, there in LaPorte, Indiana. Uh, bought gilts and a boar from each of those, and we began our venture. Um, as the breeding stock and things I felt improved, we began attending, you know, type conferences, you know, across the uh, states there. And one of the things that being young and all-knowing, we began to trail our path we felt in the purebred industry. And the interesting thing to attending to these type conferences uh, that I enjoyed was sitting down and on a bale of straw and just talking to a lot of the exhibitors and breeders that were there. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't figure that I needed anything because I knew it all, you know, as a young person starting out, you usually do. Mm -hmm. And But I was fortunate enough to listen and to take a lot of that stuff in. Little did I realize that my blazing trail was going to kind of begin to not blaze anymore and came to realize that I didn't know all that I thought that I knew. And so these words of wisdom that these uh, older gentlemen uh, shared with me began to play a major role in the process and me moving forward really in the hog industry. We took the Durox and actually began to incorporate them in our cross breeding program to add more growth and, and muscle there in the mid 80s. As that continued into the mid 80s, we began to have really good success in the show ring. Mm -hmm. By the late 80s and early 90s, um, our crossbred hogs at the shows became the ones to beat up here, you know, in our area. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, in the mid 90s, we began battling with pseudo rabies like many other, you know, producers, at least in this area, did. And so we actually dispersed of the herd and started all over in 97. Um, we went to Carl Stein at, at Stein and Stewart's and bought uh, a good number of gilts, you know, from them to, to start all over again. It was these gilts that we took some of them and uh, began using frozen semen back in the um, mid 80s and 90s with genetics that we were familiar with from that time because you know we ourselves were you know breeding hogs so by doing that we knew what worked for us and how to proceed and and uh, so we really by the early 2000s from 97 to early 2000s we had developed again a quality you know competitive duroc herd again um, and we took some of those Durox and began to cross them with uh, Chester Whites. Mm -hmm. And then we took that cross, that F1 cross, and crossed them with Hamps. And that's how we got the blue background mm -hmm. in our crossbred program. Mm -hmm. Our current herd um, really goes back to just a couple Duroc, Chester White, Hamp cross outs which then we began to cross up with exotic boars mm -hmm. or crossbred boars. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that was beginning to happen back then. It was the popular thing, but I grew up believing that purebreds would give more uniformity and consistency to the litters. So live breeding was something that uh, we practiced, you know, often. Mm -hmm. I had learned from, you know, the older gentleman, as I said, sitting on them straw bales that, it was a way to find out how good your genetics were that you were using. Mm -hmm. If you, by line breeding, if you got junk, you probably should take <laughs> a look at what you're doing and go a different direction. Right. But if you got something that was really good, then you knew that you um, would probably get consistency and predictability in the offspring. So it was a challenging for me to begin using crossbred boars because that meant that I could potentially lose the predictability and the consistency you know, in the litters that we were having or the offspring. Mm -hmm. But 
we moved forward with that, and I think because we were using crossbred boars on F2 gilts, which, you know, are three, and F2 is three breeds of a purebred, mm -hmm. um, we were able to move, maneuver through that selection process through that period fairly quickly. For us, we had found that bringing outside genetics in and putting them on our lined up crossbred females that we were able to introduce new genetics without giving up quality consistency and predictability in our herd. Right. We still practice line breeding even with the crossbreds today. Mm -hmm. We want to know what we're working with, good or bad. Right. And by doing that, this allows our customers that buy gilts or even semen from us we're able to help them know how to mate them. Mm -hmm. We've had, you know, many come in and look at our hogs over the years, and the one first comment they make is, they all look pretty much the same. Right. So the, the consistency, even when we introduce new genetics, is our goal. Um, having seven to nine sellable pigs to us is better than gambling on that one home run pig in a litter with nothing else left good enough to sell right right i i enjoy that uh, enjoy that thought and that philosophy yeah if if only uh and back to something that you said there if only we could get some of these young people to sit on a straw bale and listen to those guys and understand that you know what they they've been here they've done it they they probably know what they're talking about right well it's it's when you're long, young and just getting started, it's not so easy because, like I said, we figure that we have this plan. We have a direction that we're going to go. We think that we know what we're doing. And if you allow yourself, when you get partway down and things aren't going the way that you think that they should be, it's allowing yourself to step back and be willing to take in some of those things that you heard and try them. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it, it may be a risk, but at the same time, it may pay off and, and uh, pay out dividends. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what, you know, happened uh, for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's those things that we learned and that we tried that really um, has allowed us to develop, you know, some of the philosophies and values or convictions that, that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to those. Uh, yeah, continue, uh, I guess, continue on with a little bit of that history. I didn't mean to interrupt you and throw you off there. No. Um, you know, you talked earlier about, you know, having five kids. I got 10 grandchildren, but unfortunately, none of them are interested in, in showing hogs, at least at this point in time. So because of that, I guess I live that part out by helping other kids and their families to achieve success in life and, and in the show ring. But there's one thing that <clears throat> during that period of time, uh, when our kids were growing up, we sh they showed hogs, cattle, and, and sheep. But in the hog side of it, one of the things that I did that I thought was right was being we were in the business of selling show pigs, we sold the best ones, and our kids got to show the leftovers. Mm -hmm. that, went that went well to start with, but then people got to the point of when they bought hogs, they expected to win. And if they didn't, it was our fault. Mm -hmm. Little did they remember or f forget or whatever that there's this period of time from 50 pounds when they get them to the show that's their responsibility. Right. So when it came time for the fair or the show or whatever, and we would come in and would maybe do better than they did, mm -hmm. um, we would get accused of hiding the better pigs and not really selling the better ones when actually all it was was just management or taking care of or getting prepared for the show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it just, when I say if it, I would do something different, I would have allowed my kids to have shown the best because even when I thought that I was doing something to help other kids and families, my kids paid a price. In some respects, I paid a price because even though that I was trying to help them when they didn't have the success, when it wasn't my fault and actually more back on them, I got blamed for it. Mm -hmm. So um, I figured if I was going to get blamed for it, my kids just as well have been able to, have, you know, have shown the best. But right. Anyway, that's hindsight. 
it's just, you know, even somebody for, I guess, that is out there and has kids or maybe in the business, I guess I would say, don't be afraid to allow your kids to show the best. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some respects, you're building them, you bred them, your kids should have the opportunity to show them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. So as a result of that, and enjoying to work with kids and families and stuff, um, being I had been in the past, um, for 17 years, I was a swine superintendent at our county fair. We're all aware of what took place, <coughs> excuse me, in 2020 here with COVID-19 that most of the fairs got canceled and most of the shows got canceled. So these kids that had bought, you know, livestock or hogs um, never got the opportunity to show them. Right. Um, in our area, our show or fair is in June. So when this all when the lockdown, so to speak, took place, they'd already had their hogs and, you know, we're working with them. So when our fair was canceled and the kids were told that they weren't going to be able to show their hogs, there was something that welled up inside of me that said, we're going to make this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but little did I realize the resistance that I was going to get for making this happen. Uh, mm -hmm. There was just one roadblock after another, one hurdle after another that had to be crossed. But uh, we were able to um, find a place or private property that would allow us to have it on their farm. Uh, Jake and Jackie Keppen went through a lot to allow us to have this show um, for the kids from our county um, out at their place. Mm -hmm. And it... Um, it was a huge success. Um, it, I think with everything that was going on, it was just um, a relief. Uh, people were able to get out a little bit. Yes, we followed the protocols that you know were in place at that time, but the people were able to get out and do something. And this thing would have never have taken place also without all the help of you know the volunteers. And we had a tremendous response from sponsors. I mean, we put this thing together in about two and a half weeks. Oh, wow. And we were able to come up with sponsorship that was just really unbelievable. We had all the food was donated um, for before the show and after the show. And we'd raised enough money that each kid, we gave them a um, like a little shopping bag or whatever of stuff that had been, you know, donated or contributed mm -hmm. um, by people and from the Iowa pork producers. And and we were able to raise enough money that each kid got $240. Oh, wow. And there was all but two in the county uh, chose to participate at the show. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was just fun to see the excitement and the smiles on the face and the parents and so it was just um, probably a lot of things that I have done. That was probably one of the most rewarding, um, mm -hmm. seeing uh, uh, kids' faces. And, I mean, the seniors. Uh, I'm not telling anything that a lot of kids out there didn't experience, mm -hmm. not only from livestock, but the seniors in the athletic or any musician or anything that didn't get to experience what they wanted to. A lot of them, their graduations. Right. You know, um, mm -hmm. so... It was a very rewarding uh, experience that we were able to be a part of. Right. Well, I think that's great. And, and, yeah, I know the shows around here at that time, anybody that got to have a show, man, they just came in droves. And and uh, they really just, they did. They had that smile on their face like, oh, my gosh, we, we, we get to do this. And, and uh, seemed uh, seemed very happy to get to do that. So I'm sure uh, that, that, uh, yours, as you mentioned, did the same thing. And, and I'm sure that had to, to feel good to be a part of that. So you talked, uh, a little, uh, bit ago there in your history and you sold the whole set, uh, the whole herd and, and then you got back in, in 97 and what, what kind of philosophies did you, uh, have, or, or did you continue on? What kind of values do you have now in that, uh, breeding program? philosophies and these have been developed you know over time because like i said in the beginning you know you get your 
philosophies or convictions or values are one thing. And as you progress through life, you end up and you deal with people um, and you want to be successful and to move forward, they most likely, you know, change. And so the personal um, philosophies or values that we developed was, first of all, was honesty and integrity. Mm -hmm. um, if a litter is pharaoh January 28th, they didn't pharaoh February 1st. They pharaoh mm -hmm. January 28th. And sometimes being honest, I mean, we've lost business because we weren't willing to fudge, you know, pharaohing dates. Mm -hmm. But it's just something that we believe in. If you tell somebody you're going to do something, you know, follow through with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've learned to treat people fairly. I guess uh, some have called that, you know, the golden rule. One of the things that we've also developed is customer service has been one of the biggest things for to bring back repeat customers and for increase of our business, you know, by word of mouth. Uh, because we're not in social media, uh, it, you could look at it that it would be challenging or wondering how you're going to develop new business. Word of mouth advertisement is really the best advertisement that you can get. And mm -hmm. it's been those two things that has allowed us to survive and stay in this business almost 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we also believe that building relationships is more important than the dollar. Uh, we've learned to listen to people. Uh, we try to build bridges and by building those bridges, that in turn begins to build a network. Um, we don't have all the answers, but we may know of somebody that can answer you know, the question that you have. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've learned that we're not perfect, we make mistakes, but we're willing to own up to them and apologize because, you know, that sometimes it happens. Right. Um, probably the biggest thing that we have learned over the years is that when we surrendered our pride and prejudices towards another breeder or a, per a particular product, it was then that we began to make the biggest strides moving forward. Mm -hmm. We found out that... You know, if some place had uh, particular genetics that we felt was going to work or a piece that we needed at a particular time, we went there. And be since we've been doing that, it's really has begun to move our, you know, uh, program forward. Because um, we believe in, in building hogs, you build by pieces. You match up strengths and weaknesses. So you go out, at least we do, we go out and look for those pieces that we, you know, need at that particular time. Uh, we've taken those philosophies then and moved that into, you know, the livestock area. And the first and most important one to us is structure. You know, they have to be built right or nothing else really matters. Uh, we like our hogs to be level, to tall fronted. We like square made hogs. We like hogs that are true from shoulder to ground, from hip to hock to ground. We want all the all four feet pointing straight forward. Um, period of time in the Hampshire breed that you know that coon footedness you know was a big thing, mm -hmm. but. Uh, we like hogs that are flexible in their spine. By that I mean when they pick their head up, uh, we like for them to, for their spine to flex because if that spine doesn't flex when they lift that head up, they have more of a tendency of uh, wanting to buckle at the knee and that front foot wants to come off the ground. Whereas if the spine flexed, they can leave that foot, you know, flat on the ground. Uh, we like hogs that are loose and flexible in their joints. Mm -hmm. This allows them to take longer strides front and rear. Mm -hmm. One of the things we learned sitting on them strong bales from the older breeders, that when you're walking through the sand or through the dirt, the closer that that front foot print and that back foot print, the closer they are together, the actually the better it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we've watched hogs that back in the 80s and stuff that we had it that there, there would only be about four inches between those prints. You know, we've seen hogs currently, there could be as much as 12, 14 inches mm -hmm. between those, you know, footprints. So 
that's something that we try to look at and pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Uh, we like um, our hogs to be deep in their rib, but not only deep, but have curvature in that center part of the rib. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the selection process, why mm-hmm. that we feel is important. Mm-hmm. The heaviness of bone is something also that uh, we really like, but we don't like coarse grizzly bone. We like the more the youthful type bone. Another thing that we learned from the old time breeders sitting on them straw bales was a good indication of boars that are heavy bone uh, for them to generate that bone is the size of the base of their tail head. If they've got a smaller tail head that are heavy boned and a smaller tail head with a smaller tail, thicker, not quite as thick, not as thick a tail, the chances of them generating bone is not as good as a boar that is heavy boned that has a large tail head and a large tail. And I know that some of these things sound, oh, you got to be goofy. Uh-huh. What difference does it? What difference does the tail make? Well, I said the same thing. All I can tell you is that it's true. Um, whether you want to believe it or not, um, I'm not going to discount anybody for not believing it because I didn't myself. But we tried it and we follow. We it seems to work or follow through or carry through. You know, in our breeding program, mm-hmm. we like hogs that are square chested, square in their blades. By that, I mean that when they drop their head, the spine drops between the shoulder blades that, you know, that come up. Mm -hmm. We want our front legs with good curvature uh, that are not straight. Um, If that shoulder doesn't have uh, an angulation forward with that foot and is more straight, they're going to have a tendency of also wanting to buckle and not stay, you know, sound. Same thing works on the rear end. We like sets to that rear hock. Mm -hmm. Um, because if they get too straight hocked, they're going to have a tendency of, you know, being more up in their toes and you start getting straight legged and the more straight legged you get, the more pulsy legged, the shorter your stride is going to be. We prefer them to be up on their pasterns, but I would rather have a soft footed hog than I would that straight in the shoulder that wants to buckle at their knee. Mm -hmm. So, the pastern thing is, yes, I like them up where the dew claws are off the ground, but that is getting more and more of a challenge for that to happen. But it still doesn't mean that it's not something that we strive to make happen. Mm-hmm. Right. Your your selection process to to find these these pigs must be uh, must be a, a lot different than than what some others uh, might think. Uh, or, or my do how what's what do you do with with the selection process how do you how do you go about that well it's probably a little bit more detailed than a lot and again through the years understanding from these gentlemen that you know genetics don't lie mm-hmm. you know if you take the time to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the different lines or genetics that they're using um, they will they'll tell you but the first thing, you know, especially when we're selecting either boars uh, or females, uh, the first thing in a boars, I should say, is is for us, it's their mother. Mm-hmm. Um, the mother actually carries over 60% of the generating power for that boar. Mm-hmm. So I remember, you know, talking to different studs or different people and asking about a boar, and I go, well, what about their mom? How good is their mother? Uh, I don't know. You've <laughs> never been asked that question before. <laughs> mm-hmm. But that's really important. When you understand that the mother carries over 60% of the value of how that boar is going to generate, mm-hmm. uh, it makes a difference to us. Mm-hmm. Because if we want to provide consistent hogs and predictable hogs, we like to know. Mm-hmm. Then again, it's going back to all those structure things that we just talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I just recently mentioned that genetics don't lie. So pay attention to it. Understand the strengths and weaknesses. Also within that, you know, the genetics is what I call genetic junk. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, are they producing ruptures and prolapses and one nutters? Mm -hmm. Um, 
Our vet recommends not to keep a boar or gilt out of a litter that has more than one pig of any of those things that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, Because in doing so, it increases your probability of that happening. Now, I'm not saying that if you buy gilt from us or get semen from us that you're not going to get those things because those are recessive. And if it's on the genetic side that you are using, it it, it could pop up. But Mm -hmm. those are things that we pay a great deal of attention to ourselves that's important for us. So if if we do get a litter that has two, three, one nutters, then we don't keep anything out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, If we get, you know, ruptures or something, we don't keep anything out of it. Mm -hmm. But... um, then we move on to keep count and quality. Mm-hmm. And for the, you wouldn't think that that's a big deal on boards, but for us, our process is we, in a litter, you're going to generate both males and females. Mm-hmm. So um, it becomes important for us to watch that quality even in the count, even on the boards. Mm-hmm. And also on the boards, the testicle size makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, um, larger testicles should give you larger quantities of semen. Mm-hmm. Doesn't always happen, mm-hmm. but um, it's one of the things that we look for. Right. I like to have our boars with, you know, starter skulls um, and heavier bone work. Mm-hmm. Um, that way, and, and again, you know, we just talked about uh, what we also look for in other things, you know, with that bone work. So, and the guilt side of it. You know, structure mm-hmm. is the first thing that we look for. Right. Um, because as I said at the very beginning, if they don't have a structure, all the rest of the stuff is immaterial. Here we want that barrel ribbed. And the reason I say that is because that's really important for those females as far as getting up and down in the crate. Mm-hmm. If you have the flatter ribbed um, gilts and sows, they're going to have more of a tendency of developing abscesses or scabs on their shoulders because you don't have that rib to help them, you know, to roll up. Mm-hmm. I like uh, our females to have what I call a big, softer middle, um, which is deep-bodied and deep in the rear flank, but maybe not as hard in the rib, mm-hmm. not as lean in that rib, carrying a little extra flesh, and that flesh is important. When they begin sucking the litter, they've got to have a fat source to be able to draw from. Right. Because if they do, they're just going to get sucked down that much quicker and it decreases longevity. Vulva size to us really matters. The bigger, the better. Mm-hmm. We want our breeding gilts not to look like market gilts. Um, our breeding gilts shouldn't be pinched at the hand loin junction. And the teat quality, number, and spacing is also really important. Mm-hmm. Um, our selection process, even in the females, if they don't raise seven pigs, they don't stay here. Mm-hmm. Our, we also, over the years, have emphasized on building high-quality females. That's one of the things that probably in the show thing that we are most noted for is our females. We have a lot, a greater success with our females um, in the show ring, you know, because of the process or selection process that we've used. And the other thing is, is that you can make high-quality show pigs by the boar selection that you use. Right. Carcass characteristics are the most highly inheritable characteristics. So you can make the fastest changes in your herd mm-hmm. by the selection of the boars that you use. Mm-hmm. The, repro- the reproduction and production characteristics are the least inheritable. So if you have a non-productive herd, both growth and female-wise, it's going to take you longer to make changes in that than you are in carcass characteristics. Mm -hmm. So that's why we've focused our herd, you know, on the female side of it. You are speaking my language. You know, again, match up your matings. Mm -hmm. Match up strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. We have seen that it has been more beneficial for us to actually go out and look at the boars. You may have to drive 8, 10 hours. Mm Mm-hmm. But I can tell you from personal practical experience that most of those boars may not look like the picture that they are in the catalog. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, 
Another thing that's really important because of the process that we've used on our females, it's the longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's helped us to, you know, survive all these years. We've got a sow that's going to farrow here in December that farrowed February 6th, 2013. She will be coming with her 14th litter in here in December. Wow, that's great. we got a Duroc sow that is coming with her 12th litter. Mm-hmm. Some people will say, well, how do you, you, you can't make genetic improvement that way if you're going to keep something around that long. Look at all the different boars that you get to use over that period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about longevity, we've got a boar here, all blue sky, that'll be six mm -hmm. in February. This day and age, boars living to be six years old and giving you viable semen you can probably name them on one hand. Right. Visionary's one. Sugar Daddy's one. Our theme, you know, for our program is always trying to refine the next generation. That's why if you see our logo sometime, you've got our name um, on top of Fiery Flames mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a constant process, always refining. There's always something that you, at least we feel, there's always something that you can – improve on and it's going out and finding that piece to do that and one of the ways that that it sounds like you've done that and one of the ways that you you've kept true to to what you've done and and i've got to be real honest i was uh i was uh dumbfounded a little when you talked about it the other night you've you've used frozen semen in your breeding program uh yeah um as I said, when we had to restart uh, there in 97, it allowed us to tap into the genetics that we understood, mm -hmm. uh, the Duroc lines that we had been using and also some Duroc lines that we had wanted to try. It gave us the opportunity to do that, and it really enabled us to um, move forward fairly quickly with you know, our herd again. Uh, we produced a boar called Bull Adventure that was very popular in the Duroc breed uh, that many breeders used across the United States. And um, there were he was premier sire at uh, a number of shows. Now, we don't have the boars out there like a, a lot of breeders did. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for us, um, we were pleased to be able to have one in a stud that did as well as he did so yeah we've used in frozen semen we believe in frozen semen and understand now that um, some of these uh, studs are beginning to freeze their prospect boars and uh, are selling it so there's just some things that i would like to share that we have learned through the years and by doing this that uh, are really kind of important if you are considering using frozen semen. Mm -hmm. um, frozen semen is quite a bit different using frozen semen than, than fresh semen. First of all, the shelf life of frozen semen is only about six hours. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things in using frozen semen is your management or your heat detection. Mm -hmm. um, you really need to be heat checking uh, every 12 hours, night and morning, um, so that you can get that um, semen in at the right time. Uh, most of uh, the gilts are going to ovulate at about 30 hours after standing heat. The sow is going to ovulate about 32 hours. So mm -hmm. if you heat check once a day, you could be off right. by 12, 14 hours. Mm -hmm. um, so it, your service is not going to be at the right time because, again, the longevity of the semen, viability of the semen isn't as long as fresh semen. Because fresh semen today can last 12 to 15 hours, you know, the sow with the extenders that they've got. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's really important is know how long uh, your tank will stay charged, which means how long the nitrogen will last mm -hmm. in there. If your tank lasts three months and you go four months and open the lid up and lift up a canister and you go, well, how come it's not cold? <laughs> well, your semen's all dead and you just lost whatever money 
that you had in that semen. So uh, know how long when you get your tank, know how long it'll stay charged and get it charged. Right. You know, if you've got a six-month tank or a nine-month tank, you need to either get on a route, find a, a cattle breeder maybe in the area that, um, I mean, you can probably help them with that, mm-hmm. get set up on a route for um, getting their uh, tank charged at um, a regular time or basis. Right. Right. Um, when you are wanting to breed, uh, and you open up your tank and you pull your canister up, do not take your canister out of the tank to get your straw uh, because the temperature drop, um, it's the freezing and warming up of the semen. If you do that all the time, um, will reduce the viability of your semen. So keep your canister right at the crown of the your tank, uh, the opening of the tank, and reach down and either with the tweezers or something to pull the straw out. I've learned that it's better to do that on your fingertips than <laughs> using your fingertips. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, another thing that's really important is the thawing process. Whatever company that you're using or um, you're getting semen from, get their thawing process and follow that precisely because it makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. But there's one more thing that's really important that a lot of them, at least it was and has been to this point in time that we have been told, and that's find out what extender that you're, wherever you're getting your frozen semen from, is using that those bores were frozen in, what the extender was, so that you can have the same extender thawed that you are going to put that frozen semen in once it's thawed into. If you use two different kinds of extender, I have been told that there's a very good chance that you could kill that semen. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the first things that we were told at the very beginning Mm -hmm. is make sure that the extender that you're going to thaw out is the same extender as what was used when they froze the bore. Mm -hmm. If these processes are followed using frozen semen can be very successful and a good tool for your you know program Mm -hmm. Uh, we recently used um, uh, frozen semen um, this fall um, with some directs we had frozen a couple of our own boars and we bred eight of our directs to frozen semen and settled seven of them wow we were very pleased with that result that's better than fresh semen right yes and uh, had that success by following those protocols and and heat checking and and taking a lot of time i'm sure yeah again it's following the procedures you know um our particular process is your hot water bath needs to be at 50 degrees centigrade uh your extender needs to be at 20 degrees centigrade you take the straw out and immediately put it in your hot water bath. It's got to be in there for 45 seconds. Mm-hmm. And you pull it out and clip the end off and stick it in. Mm-hmm. And they want you to get it in the sow within um, a half hour. Because mm-hmm. the longer that it sits in the bottle, mm-hmm. it gives you that much less time for, you know, them little swimmers uh, to get up to where it needs to be. Right. Well, that uh, that's very interesting and very interesting to me. Again, uh, I've I've been involved with the with the pigs a bit, but but not a lot of the breeding. And and I think that frozen semen, uh, I think it, uh, I think that's a great that's a great thing. And and I was uh, really uh, excited to hear about it and and excited to hear that that you were already doing it and and using it. So uh, I think that's great. Yeah, one of those next generation things. You think? <laughs> Correct. I mean, it, well, it. <laughs> Not only next generation, but previous generations. Right. And yes, I mean, it hasn't been in the hog industry as long as it has been in the cattle industry. Mm-hmm. Our straws are quite a bit bigger mm-hmm. than what they are in the cattle, but I understand that there's a new freezing process and the straws are smaller now for swine than what they used to be. Our mm-hmm. straws that, that we have used and are currently using are about a foot long and probably a quarter inch thick. Mm-hmm. So. 
We've even got some semen lots uh, in this sale that uh, that we're getting ready to talk about here in just a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Ray, are you ready to go into to, to these this sale that that you've got going on? Sure. Okay. If you would give us, uh, it, it's on showpig.com. If you would give us some dates and and uh, things like that, and and then we'll kind of get into the, some of those lots. It's uh, scheduled for Monday, November twenty third. I guess it's supposed to start at four o'clock. I think it's Eastern time, and uh, she'll be on the way. Mm hmm. Good. Yeah, I'm sure uh, getting things finished up and, and wrapped up and, and ready for that and uh, always an exciting time to, to get ready for those. Yeah, well, more of a challenging time than an exciting <laughs> time because we've had – our sows are out on dirt mm -hmm. and we've had over an inch of rain the last couple of days and now it's snowing mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be 16 degrees uh, in the morning and we don't have all the pictures taken yet. So – and it's supposed to – it's supposed to rain on Saturday. Oh, boy. They would like to have our sale page set up by Monday, so mm -hmm. I've got some work to do. Right. That'll, that'll make it make it interesting. So It'll make it something. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and, and learning a little about this sale. Now, not, not everybody does this that, that you're getting ready to do here for, for this sale uh, on November 23rd. Not everybody offers their foundation female. No matter, it, it doesn't matter what it is. But but you are you're going to offer one of your very best foundation females, is my understanding. Well, yeah, it um, it was a uh, wrestling match with myself, I guess to say, mm -hmm. to make that decision. You know, not only do most not offer their foundation sow. They don't offer their foundation sow in her prime. Mm -hmm. um, she's coming with her fifth letter. Um, so it's, yeah, it was difficult. But I guess we feel that there's two reasons. Um, we want to offer our genetics um, to the public mm -hmm. and not just, we want to offer the best. And uh, in doing so, in some respects, it puts pressure on us. If we want to maintain our herd, then we've got to have something to follow her up with. Mm -hmm. um, but with the job that she has done in just four parodies, the daughters that we have laid in, uh, we've got a son of her, a boy we call Special K, that's King of the Hill son. Um, and then we've got a grandson of her that we call Beast Mode. Um, so and we now have another grandson in the pipeline um, out of 7-Up. Uh, Beast Mode is an anchorman son. Uh, we feel that we can maintain her worth, you know, in the herd mm -hmm. and therefore offer her, give somebody else um, out there the opportunity to um, benefit from what we have done already from her in such a short period of time mm -hmm. that we're willing to offer her and see if the public is has interest. And this is the lot one female that we're talking about. And, and if you would give us a, a little pedigree, maybe maybe somebody might not be uh, very familiar with her. So if you would give us some pedigree info and, and uh, give us some more info on her. Yeah, she, um, she as I said, she's coming with her fifth parody. Um, she's a sugar daddy. And a lot of those in the industry are well aware of Sugar Daddy and, and how great the, the mothers are out of him. Uh, on the bottom side, she's a Blue Fortune. Blue Fortune is a boar that we raised that was blue, but he was out of fortune on a killer instinct sow. Mm -hmm. And so that's what she is out of. She is bred to, as I said earlier, to her grandson, Beast Mode, which is an Anchorman X-ray Vision back on top of her mm -hmm. uh, she's bred um, she was bred uh, september 18th and 19th and uh, my gut tells me that this is going to be one of her best litters mm -hmm. and that was another reason that um, it was difficult to decide 
you know, to put her up. And the reason that I say that is, is because we have learned how to mate her. Mm -hmm. And beast mode is very thick and massive, heavy boned, um, and really square in his top with good, you know, turn to his loin edge. And it's that she has generated, like I said, a lot of females for us. Mm -hmm. um, we use a Wintex bore on her um, for a spring litter and <clears throat> had, um, there was a barrow that was named champion at their county and then was was named champion overall market hog and therefore won uh, the right or earned the right to go to the all district or all Iowa district showdown. Mm -hmm. Um which in the state of Iowa has become a very big thing is to earn the right to go to the showdown. Mm -hmm. um, the Meitner Show Pigs was the family that bought that barrel, and Ray Lynn was the young gal that showed, you know, him. And so, you know, one of the other couple other things that I want to mention, you know, about her is makes it her a foundation. She is. That's a lot of the sugar daddy. She's a tremendous milking sow. Mm -hmm. Her pigs are usually the biggest, you know, at weaning in her group. And trust me, you don't have to be in the farrowing house to know when she is nursing her pigs. Mm -hmm. because she is loud. <laughs> um, her And she's passed that on to her daughters, the ones that we have farrowed already, mm -hmm. um, obviously, because the X-ray vision sugar daddy daughter that is farrowed, you know, has given us beast mode in her first litter, and she's actually the mother of the other boar that we got in the pipeline, uh, the Seven Up Son, uh, which is another one of the boars that we have, which is a visionary Bear 274 on target. Mm -hmm. She is massive in her body. She is wide chested, excellent on her feet and legs, with good bone. She's moderate in her frame, uh, which frame size is. You know, for some, I would say that she's the right frame size for a lot of those that are in the show pig industry. Mm -hmm. She's not only it's she's not only good physically, but she's good genetically. I guess right. is another way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you guys uh, gonna want to make sure you check her out. Uh, I've got a picture of her here, and uh, boy, she is a uh, she is a nice nice female, high quality female, and uh, I'm sure, like you said, it, it took a lot to to put her in this sale? Well, the other thing for us anyway, that it, um, one of the other things that contributed to make it so difficult is for us, um, not every female will give you competitive males and competitive females. Right. Or males that will generate and females that will generate. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Special K, the king of the hill son that we got, which is the son of hers, has proven himself because he's had champions in just his first year. And so she proved to, you know, generate a male that generates. Mm -hmm. And then the daughter of her, the X-ray vision sugar daddy, um, generated another male. So um, both the males and females out of her have already generated. And for us, that's not very easy to put together. Usually they'll generate females right. or they'll generate males. Right. High quality sow and uh, uh, wish you luck on, on getting her sold and, and uh, the, the new person, uh, the new purchaser of her should uh, be, be ready to roll with her. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the lot two, you've got a, a special deal here uh, as you're going to sell a choice between two of them. These are actually two of her daughters, mm -hmm. uh, and they're also litter mates to Special K. Uh, so we're giving um, the buyer the choice of whichever one of these two that he would like. The other one will stay here in our herd, um, which is really the thing with all of these lots. If there is something that doesn't sell, mm -hmm. you know, we keep it and, and farrow it. Mm -hmm. Lot 2A, 21 the ear notch 2110 um, is probably a little bit more moderate in her frame size. She's really deep bodied, heavy boned, 
um, really good on her feet and legs. Uh, she is bred to Rocket Man. She was bred on 817. Rocket Man is a hush money all blue sky boar that we have raised that is extremely good in his hip and hind leg, the mobility and length of stride that he takes. Um, good down his top. Uh, the reason he got the name Rocket Man is because ever since he was a little pig, he was more chisel fronted. I mean, he's extended in his front end and he walks uphill. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that him on her uh, will generate some pigs that will have good bone, good body, and should be good in their mobility. Lot 2B, the other litter mate, 2114, is a little bit bigger framed. Uh, I think that 2110 probably took the frame size of mom, uh, lot 2B, probably took more of the frame size of dad. Mm -hmm. um, so, but 2114, both of these sows are uh, calicos. Uh, 2114 might be a tick heavier bone. Uh, again, she's a little bigger framed. She's square in her blades, square down her top, really good also on her feet and legs. And she proved to be a really good mom. I mean, 2110 raised eight pigs, which we're very happy with. But 2114 raised 11 pigs in her first litter. Oh, wow. Um, she is bred to beast mode. So she combines that sugar daddy sow on both sides. Those pigs will have that sugar daddy sow on both sides. Mm -hmm. So this is some of that line breeding that we talked about earlier mm -hmm. um, in our history. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, both of those will be offered up on buyer's choice um, in lot two. Right, and two uh, uh, high quality boars, and, and again, I got a picture of Beast Mode uh, here, and uh, boy, he, yeah, Beast Mode, what a good name for him. <laughs> <laughs> he is thick and massive and heavy bone. Yeah. Um, his uh, his rear legs are actually bigger than his front legs. Mm-hmm. And the people that have seen him in person say that the pictures do not do him justice. He's just really stout. He looks a lot like his daddy. For anybody that has seen Anchorman in person, mm -hmm. this guy looks a lot like him, only a bit longer legged uh, than his dad, and uh, but just massive hog mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of muscle and thickness and really good rib shape. He's a good one. What uh, what what other lots you you want to talk about? You want to keep going down through some of these, or yeah, let's uh, go down. We've only got uh, eleven, twelve lots, so sure. if you don't mind, we'll just go down through the sale. Sure, go right ahead. Lot three is uh, forty four dash five. Um, she was born on eight one nineteen. She is out of our seven up board, as I said earlier. Seven up is a visionary bear two seventy four on target. He was bred by. Park and Livestock here in Iowa out of the 59.4 Sugar Daddy Sal. Um, she is a belted hog that is square made, really good in her rib and body, good down with her muscle, good on her feet and legs. And uh, she is bred to, uh, was bred on 920 to All Blue Sky. Mm -hmm. All Blue Sky is a boar that we raised which is a son of Skyrocket on an All-Pro sow. An All-Pro was a son of All-Star, which was at Canes. The interesting thing, too, is that All Blue Sky will be six years old here in February, and he is still producing competitive hogs and champions. Um, for example, uh, there was an All Blue Sky daughter that was shown by the Bowen family in Missouri this last summer uh, that usually won her class and stood third overall behind a guilt from Heimers and one from Sloan's. Mm -hmm. In fact, at one of the shows, uh, we were told um, that uh, Jake Laird of Premium Blend Genetics was a judge, um, and he had his reasons. He called her one of the best hip and hind legged gilts that he had seen in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, that gilt that the Mowen family showed was bred by Meitner family. And, um, but it just, it, and she was blue. All blue sky is blue. 
um, and this gilt was blue. And blue and calicos uh, are popular, you know, with a lot of kids. Right. So that's another thing that uh, you potentially could get blues um, with this litter also. Mm-hmm. I've got a picture of her as well, and she's really good. This this litter will combine visionary, sugar daddy, and sky's the limit, mm-hmm. which are three Hall of Fame boars. Mm-hmm. Wow! Yeah, so a lot of uh, a lot of high quality genetics in in that one. Lot number four, fifty thirteen, was bred or was farrowed at eight thirty one eighteen. Uh, she's a Hold My Beer 133 back on 5.9 Killer Instinct. She was bred on 8.30.20 to Special K. Uh, this is a repeat, meet, repeat uh, mating. Uh, we farrowed her this summer. She weaned 11 pigs. We have retained three gilts out of her on Special K the first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's the daughter of... Uh, the great 5-9 killer instinct sow here, which is probably the other foundational sow. I told you earlier that we had a sow that was coming with a 14th parity. That's this sow. Oh, wow. Longevity built in. With the uh, Hold My Beer 133 Ge- Wintex genetics, they have given our pigs a little bit more crispness to the loin edge. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's really worked well with the uh, extra ribbon body that, you know, on the female side. And um, so there's them, the daughters that we kept out of her are really big ribs, soft in the middle, square top, really good on their feet and legs, heavy mode. Uh, this sow is great in her design. She's square top. She's square in her chest and she's good in her ribbon body and good on her feet and legs. Mm-hmm. Bred, to the, bred to the Calico Special K. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Another uh, another high quality high quality bull. You'll get you should get belted pigs because she's a belt, and you should get some calicos because that's mm-hmm. what her first litter gave. Mm-hmm. That's neat. Yeah, mix it up a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Lot five and six we go we go dirt rock style here. Yep. Twenty nine dash four. Pharaoh uh, two sixteen of nineteen. Uh, she's a Focus on 27.9 Prince Louis. Focus is at Shipley's. Prince Louis was at uh, Kane's. Uh, she's bred to, or she's was bred on 9.23 and 24 to 14-6 Red Warrior. Red Warrior is a Duroc boar that we have raised that is out of Bachelor on top of a Clydesdale sow. Um, this sow was actually a litter mate to the champion purebred that went on to be named the grand champion overall breeding guilt at the 2019 Mauer County Fair. Uh, she went on then and was reserve champion class two purebred Duroc at the 2019 Minnesota State Fair. 29.4, this sow is great in her design, level in her top, heavy boned, good set to her rear leg. Square on her chest and is good rib shape. Mm-hmm. Bred to Red Warrior, he should add bone and more ribbon body yet to her because Red Warrior is monster bone with a tremendously big rib cavity in him. Mm-hmm. Really good on his feet and legs. Mm-hmm. Lot 7, 10 10, was uh, born on 8 18. She is a daddy, daddy's home on 613 Blue Fortune. Daddy's home um, is at Nathan Ray's, or was at Nathan Ray's. Uh, this sow was actually bred by Meitner Show Pigs. She is bred, she was bred on 819 and 20 to beast mode. Interesting thing is, in her first litter, she was the mother of the reserve champion Market Barrow at the 2020 Worth County Youth Open. Wow. She is also a litter mate to the mother of that blue gilt that I just told you about that bone showed in Missouri mm-hmm. out of all blue sky. Mm-hmm. Wow. Stacked on top of stacked in this thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you let these go? <laughs> well, like I said, when you're not on social media, the best way to do it is again is word of mouth. And <laughs> right. success is, 
you know, that part of the reason that we're having another sale is because the sale that we had last year um, not only was successful financially, but it was successful for our customers. Mm -hmm. That's another reason to, you know, we feel to continue with it. Mm -hmm. If our customers can have success, then I look at the word successful also. Right. Excellent. Excellent thought and philosophy. Lot 8 is 27 12. This is a blue sow coming with her second litter. She's a king of the hill back on 615 Blue Fortune. She was bred 819 to Instant Regret at Wintech. Mm -hmm. Instant Regret is a anchorman son that Will, you know, kept down there. Mm -hmm. um, she, her mother, this 615 Blue Fortune was also the mother of a very popular blue gilt that Mitch Harkin showed a couple of years ago in the Iowa jackpot circuit uh, that stood third overall in the light cross division at the end mm -hmm. um, in points. So, wow. um, and bred to um, instant regret, these pigs should have tons of bone and be thick. And uh, this blue sow has just got lots of bone, rib, body, level in her design, really good in her feet and legs and, and athletic, good extension through her front end. So um, I think that this could be an awful good set of pigs mm -hmm. in this slot. Right. Lot 9 is 41-10. Uh, she was born on 728-19. She is a 7-up, back on top of 17 11 all blue sky. She was bred to, or bred on ten eight to beast mode. Oh wow! Um, Seventeen eleven uh, would have been a double bred five nine, or she would have had five nine on both sides of her pedigree because all blue sky is a grandson of five nine and seven. So and then on the from the bottom side of 1711 she was an all blue sky 59 so 59 is on both sides mm -hmm. of that bred to beast mode i'd look for bone and mass and muscle in this litter and longevity because you've got on the female side of this pedigree you've got visionary killer instinct and sugar daddy mm -hmm. um, that's some pretty good boards to have in your pedigree mm -hmm. this gilt 4110 is a blue butt um, very square in her blades, good in her design, deep in her body and rib. She's got good shape to her center part of her rib. And again, really good in her feet and legs and uh, has good uh, mobility to her. Mm -hmm. Lot 10, 36-10, was born on 7-16-18. She's a promised land, 612 Blue Fortune, um, bred on 10, 8, and 9. She's also bred to beast mode, and 612 went to Joe Crawford's in Michigan, and he is just extremely pleased, you know, with her mm -hmm. as far as production. Mm -hmm. Promised Land has worked really well for us and our herd. Uh, it's a visionary son that has added, actually, uh, some more look and gives us um, good muscle shape. Uh, some of the visionaries can give you some muscle, um, but not a lot of turn to the loin edge. Uh, Promised Land has done that for us. And again, you got uh, the five nine killer instinct sow on the bottom side. And now you're combining the good sugar daddy sow mm -hmm. with the good five nine. So you're combining two of our foundational sows in the offspring of this litter. Wow. Lot 11. This is an interesting lot. It's 33-9. Uh, she uh, is, is the oldest sow that we've got on the sale. She's an all-star, 5-5 five, five killer instinct. She was bred on 8-30-20 to Rocket Man. Mm -hmm. For those that followed our sale last year, you may have recognized this sow. She was offered on the sale last year but didn't sell, mm -hmm. which was good for us because her litter out of 7-Up gave the champion crossbred guilt which later on was named the champion overall breeding guilt which then was selected to go to the all iowa district showdown just here this summer mm -hmm. so it worked well for us that she didn't sell isn't, on the sale isn't it funny how uh, things so, work out like that excuse me 
I said, isn't it funny how things work out like that? That's right. So <laughs> we thought we would offer her again. And we feel that bred to Rocket Man, that her pigs will probably, should be heavier boned and a little thicker and more squareness at top than what they were even out of 7-Up. And that 7-Up guilt was really deep bodied and really good on her feet and legs and um, just very good design. Uh, the all-star sow is belted. She's deep in her body, uh, level in her top, really thick out through her top and out through her rear end. And again, really good on her feet and legs. Pretty sure the, the, the nice rocket band and away you go again. So that's the females that we're offering on the sale. Mm -hmm. You've got a couple other special lots. You've, you're actually going to, you're going to sell some semen. Yeah, we're going to, um, the project manager, um, uh, recommended that uh, we offer some semen lots. So we're gonna offer some semen lots on this sale uh, to some of the boars that we've got. And we're also going to offer prospect purchase certificates, which means that there'll be some $500 uh, certificates um, auctioned off uh, to put towards or to buy prospects um, next spring. Mm -hmm. If anybody has interest in that, mm -hmm. you already have you have that spring. Uh, how do you do your your spring pigs? I would say that ninety nine percent of our hogs are sold off the farm. Mm -hmm. um, we don't go to haven't for the last couple of years uh, gone to any sales, um, and we don't do online sales in the spring. Um, again, we've been able to increase our business, and we can sell them off the farm. Um, so we are continuing to do that, um, the word of mouth and has been successful for us. And we feel that even with these, um, red sows that we offer as the more that people get out. And I think through this podcast and people understand, um, and hear more about us mm -hmm. that, um, that in itself, even though that we aren't on social media, we're on social media. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so we're grateful. We're grateful to you guys in this podcast to, because my understanding is that it's on Facebook and Instagram mm -hmm. and Twitter and YouTube and. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And on Podbean. So uh, yeah, we get out get out quite a few places. So uh, I appreciate you appreciate you taking the offer and and putting this together and. Um, want to uh, want to wish you luck on this sale, uh, Ray. What about uh, what about pickup on these uh, sows and and things like that? Pickup delivery. What's what's the story on that for this sale? Um, on the sows, all the sale prices are picked up on the farm, but we will help um, in delivery. Uh, we'll probably do pretty much like we did last year. Uh, we will work with the buyers uh, and come up with a, a moderate fee uh, we're planning on delivering to Myrtle, south dakota um, ottawa uh, illinois uh, kansas city missouri uh, will deliver up into the twin city area mm -hmm. and if there is something else that pops up that we can help or assist you know in delivery um, we will do everything that we can to work with a potential customer as far as hooking up with them and and getting them delivered well that's great yeah just uh get in get to a a uh, location around there and and you'll help them get there and so uh that customer service that you talked about right and the other thing is i guess especially with bred females we're a pers negative herd um and um we just feel more comfortable um, being able to work delivery directly with the potential customer mm -hmm is um, putting them, you know, on a um, shipping, you know, company. Mm -hmm. Now, that's another, you know, avenue that can be done. Mm -hmm. And I understand that sometimes, you know, that's necessary to um, be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in the process of working with, you know, at least one of those couriers to be able to hook up with them to be able to deliver you know, again, into Indiana and, and, but especially out to the West Coast. But we were able to hook up with people in 
um, Wyoming last year and Myrtle, South Dakota. Uh, so, um, you know, we can get to the northwest quite a ways out there by, you know, meeting in Myrtle. Uh -huh. And uh, get those get those out there to them. Uh, yeah, what what great customer service and uh, keeping keeping those pigs healthy. So, uh, Ray, I really appreciate. Uh, you uh, responding to Brandy and, and uh, being willing to do this and, and get this put together. And I sure have learned a lot. I uh, sure have had a lot of fun putting this together with you. And, and again, uh, I want to wish you luck and, and have everybody go see that sale and, and check out these awesome sows and uh, what what uh, the Gasco Farm has to offer there on showpig.com. And, again, that sale is November 23rd. And so, uh, Ray, just want to want to thank you and, and wish you a lot of luck on the sale. Thank you, and thank you for having me. All right. Well, again, we appreciate it. Again, November 23rd, showpig.com, uh, Ray Gaskill Farms. And we want to thank you for listening to another edition of Before the Bid podcast. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Before the Bid. For more information and to learn more about upcoming podcasts and sales, visit us at beforethebid.podbeam.com or Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram pages. For information on being a guest on Before the Bid, please email us at beforethebid at gmail.com or one of our social media pages. Remember, that's beforethebid at gmail.com. Happy sales to you, and we will talk to you next time on Before the Bid.